So we are going to talk about the definitions of connectedness and path connectedness. And this video assumes familiarity with the Euclidean topology and the induced topology. Now the idea of connectedness is we want to say whether we can split a topological space into two separate parts. So this triangle on the left side is a connected topological space because there's no way that we can split it up. But if we look at the triangle on the right with these openings, this is not a connected topological space because we can separate this triangle into two different parts, this part right here and this other part. So the general idea of connectedness is can we split up the topological space into two parts? But if we look at the triangle on the left side, we could also split it into two disjoint sets. I can always draw a circle on this topological space and say, take the part on the inside of this circle as one set and the rest as another set. So we've split up the topological space into two parts. But this situation is different from the situation on the right. Because when I draw the circle on this left triangle, notice that it has to intersect the triangle itself. It has to have points right here that are on the triangle. On the other hand, with this topological space on the right, I can draw a circle that separates these two parts and doesn't intersect the triangle at all. So it seems like the difference between these two situations, where we're drawing a boundary line and splitting the topological space into two parts, is can we draw a boundary line that doesn't intersect the actual triangle? Now one key fact about connectedness is it's a property of the topological space itself and the topology on that space. So when we say that this triangle is connected, it's not important that that triangle is a subset of the Euclidean space R2. The fact that it's connected is just because of the topology on the points in this triangle. And that topology comes from the induced topology from R2 on the subset, which is the triangle. If we wanted to find connectedness for arbitrary topological spaces, for things that aren't necessarily subsets of R2, we want to just look at the topology on the points in the topological space. So in other words, we want to just consider the points on this triangle without having to draw boundary circles that contain points that aren't in the triangle at all. So how can we define connectedness without drawing boundary circles by only considering the topology on the triangle itself? So we originally said that the difference between these two cases is that for the triangle on the right, we can draw a boundary circle that splits up the topological space and also doesn't intersect the triangle. But is there a way to rephrase that that doesn't talk about the boundary circle itself, that just talks about the points on the triangle? Now remember that when we have a subset of some topological space, in this case we have this triangle, which is a subset of R2, we can define an induced topology on this subset S. And the open sets in the induced topology are S intersect U for all of the U which are open in R2. If we go over here and look at our boundary circle, this circle splits the entire space R2 into two parts. If we look at the interior of this circle, that gives us an open set in R2. And that means that the triangle intersect the interior of the circle is an open set in the induced topology on S. So therefore, this little section of the triangle, this is an open set in the induced topology on the triangle. And we can do the exact same thing for the outside of the circle. Because if we take the whole rest of the plane minus this entire circle in the interior, that also gives us an open set in R2. So if we take the intersection of the triangle with everything outside the circle, we get an open set on the triangle. So the inside here, this section of the triangle, is an open set. And the rest of this triangle, that's also an open set in the induced topology. So what we've shown is that in the induced topology on the triangle, we can write the triangle as the union of two disjoint, because they don't intersect each other, non-empty 
and open sets. Now let's see if we can do something similar on the triangle over here. Well, we have this boundary circle. We can definitely look at the interior of the circle and then the whole rest of the plane. The problem here is that there are points on the triangle that intersect the boundary circle. We want to look at two open sets that give us the entire triangle. But if we look at the interior of the circle, we're going to miss the points on the boundary. And if we look at the whole rest of the plane minus the circle, we're also going to miss the points on the boundary. So there's no way that we can split this triangle up into two open sets without missing some points on the boundary. And that's the difference between these two cases. Of course, we can always write a topological space as the union of two sets, but we can't always write it as the union of open sets that are disjoint and non-empty. So if we're looking at a general topological space, we say that this space is connected, like this triangle on the left, if it cannot be written as the union of two disjoint, non-empty open sets. So this is the definition of connectedness for an arbitrary topological space. And the basic idea is that a space is connected if we cannot write it as the union of two open sets. Now, this definition captures what we want connectedness to be. And it agrees with our intuition on some of the examples like these two triangles here. One question you might have though is how exactly would you use this definition of connectedness if you're trying to prove something about a topological space? Well, one way to think about the definition of connectedness is to start with the decomposition of our topological space into two open sets. This equation here, where we split a topological space into two disjoint open sets, that's allowed even if the topological space is connected. What isn't possible is for A and B to be disjoint, non-empty open sets. So if we have this decomposition here, where we split S into A and B, and these are disjoint open sets, in order for S to be connected, it cannot be the case that both A and B are non-empty. Because if they were both non-empty, that would violate the definition of S being connected. So if we get this kind of decomposition into open sets, what that means is one of these two sets is empty. Either A is the empty set or B is the empty set. And there are a lot of situations where this implication is very useful. For example, let's say that we have some function that takes inputs on a topological space and goes to the real numbers where the space S is connected. And let's say that we want to prove that the function F is a constant. One way that we can do that is by trying to prove that the level sets, in other words, the sets of X in S, where F of X equals some fixed value C. We want to show that these level sets are open sets. And the reason is these level sets are disjoint for different values of C. Because if f of x equals C, then it can't also equal something else. So if we consider all of these level sets, these are going to be disjoint, and they also cover the entire topological space. Because f of x is always going to equal some real number. So if we take the union of all of these, we'll get the entire topological space, S. So if we can prove that these sets right here are open, what we get is S as the union of a bunch of disjoint open sets. And what that means is that all of the sets except one has to be empty. Because if more than one of them are non-empty, then we can always find a way to split S into two disjoint non-empty open sets. And if all of the level sets except one are empty, what that means is that f of x equals c, that same value of c, on the entire topological space. In other words, f is constant on s. So that's one example of how we can use connectedness to prove important properties about topological spaces. 
So the idea of connectedness is pretty useful, but it also has some weird edge cases. Let's look at an example of one of those. Say we consider the graph of the function y equals sine of 1 over x. So the graph of this function is at first going to look kind of like a normal sine, but then as we approach x equals 0, it's going to oscillate faster and faster and faster like this until we reach the point x equals 0 right here. Now, let's say that we consider the topological space which is the union of this graph with this line right here at x equals 0. Is this topological space connected? The answer is yes, because of course the graph of sine 1 over x, that part is connected if we just consider x greater than 0, because the function sine 1 over x is continuous if x is greater than 0. So this part of our topological space is connected. And this line right here is also connected. But the thing is, there's no way for us to split up the entire topological space into two open sets. Because these little lines, these oscillations in the graph of sine 1 over x, they get infinitely close to this extra line that we added at x equals 0. So this is actually a connected topological space. The problem is, this is a kind of weird example of connectedness. It's not the same kind of connected as the triangle. Because if we start from some point on the curve over here, on the graph of sine 1 over x, there's no way for us to get to this line at x equals 0 on a continuous path. If we look at the triangle over here, on any two points of the triangle, there's always a path that we can follow along the triangle to get between those points. But that's actually not the case in this situation, because there's no path along these infinitely many oscillations that gets us from a point on the graph to a point on this line at x equals 0. So this idea of whether there exists a path between two points on a topological space motivates us to come up with a new definition of connectedness which is called path connectedness. So we say that a topological space is path connected if we can always find a path between any two points on the topological space. Now the idea of a path is that it's a continuous curve along the topological space that takes us between the two points. So the starting point on the curve is the first point we're looking at and the ending point is the second point. Now to make that more rigorous, we can talk about a curve as a function from the interval 0, 1 to the topological space s. If we look at some value of t in the interval 0, 1, the value of gamma t is just some point on the topological space. So if we follow gamma of t across the entire interval 0, 1, that's going to give us a curve of points along that topological space. And in order for this function to count as a path, it has to be a continuous function. So now we can say that a topological space is path connected if for any two points on the topological space, there exists a continuous function from 0, 1 to that topological space where the start point is the first point we're considering and the end point is the second point we're considering. So in other words, gamma of 0 is the first point, and gamma of 1 is the second point. So this example, where we take the graph of sine 1 over x, and then the line at x equals 0, this topological space is connected, but it is not path connected. So there's no continuous function from 0, 1 to this subset of R2, where we start on some point on the graph, and then we get to the line x equals 0. And it turns out that in general, being path connected is strictly stronger than being connected. So any topological space that is path connected will also be connected. So this gives us a different way to think about whether a topological space can be split into two different parts.